Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I do have a loud enough voice when amplified by the microphone to make you all look, which is a good start. Thank you very much for coming along to our talk. I'm Helen Evans KC, and this is my colleague, Mary Claire O'Kane. And we're going to be talking to you this afternoon about limitation clauses. So if you're expecting something else, now is your chance to make for the exit. It's unlikely that it crossed the mind of Mr. Neil Gerrard of um, ENRC and Deckert uh, fame when he first started acting on the ENRC case that one of the lesser known highways and byways of the claim would be a dispute over the limitation of liability terms. But his actions did lead to that. And whilst the dispute over them is one of the less known aspects of this long run running litigation, I think it's a good illustration of how multifaceted disputes over limitation clauses can be. Let me explain what I mean. There were four strands of argument in the Deckert case about limitation of liability clauses. The first was whether a clause limiting Deckert's liability could possibly apply to a claim against it for repayment of its own fees. This was a contractual construction type point with some policy underpinnings. The second was whether Deckert's clause was reasonable under UCTA. That's quite a familiar type of argument uh, about the statutory breaks on limitation clauses. The third was about whether the cap could apply to losses arising from fraud or reckless breach of duty, which was a mix between a contractual construction point and a policy point. And the final point was a variation on the third, namely whether the cap could apply to a deliberate breach of duty. I'm going to be telling you a bit more about this case later, but I start by referring to it because I think it's a good illustration of why you have to have your wits about you when you're dealing with arguments about limitation clauses. The word limitation clause tends to make people think immediately of UCTA, but in fact, limitation clauses can engage a far broader range of issues than that. The laws governing them, or perhaps better described as the laws potentially standing in their way, can span common law, a variety of different statutes, rules governing the conduct of different professions, and the law of damages. If anyone is sitting here in the audience thinking, well, I act for defendants, this is largely a problem for claimants, I'm afraid this is far from the case. Of course, those of us who act for defendants often have to advise on the likely enforceability of these types of clauses, both so the client can think about amending them, if needs be, and because insurers need to know what to reserve. Furthermore, I've had more and more cases recently where there are multi-defendant cases where one defendant has to take a pot shot at somebody else's limitation clauses in order to protect itself. So there's a wide range of things that can come up. And knowing where to look to find the relevant law can be difficult because there is such a bewildering patchwork of different provisions that can apply from a variety of sources. That's where Mary Claire and I come in. What we are hoping to cover in the next 45 minutes or so is four main areas. Marie Claire is going to start by explaining some of the core ideas that underpin the different types of clause that you're likely to encounter. I'm going to then deal with some of the common roadblocks in the way of those clauses. Marie Claire is going to give us an update on disclaimers, where there's been quite a lot of relevant law, both in relation to disclaiming liability to your own client and disclaiming liability to third parties. And then I'm going to finish off with a small topic namely net contribution clauses. So I'll start by handing over to Mary Claire, who's going to be dealing with the overview. Thanks, Helen. Limitation of liability clauses come in a variety of different shapes and sizes beginning with those applicable to the professional's own client. First and foremost, there are scope of work clauses. These exclude a specific duty to do something which might otherwise be accepted. For example, an architect's terms may set out a duty to carry out periodic inspection of building works, but expressly state that the architect is under no duty to supervise the execution of the works. On one view, the effect of such clauses is simply to define what the professional undertakes to do, rather than to exclude or limit liability, 
However, that distinction is not always clear cut in practice. For example, the aforementioned architect, whilst not obliged to supervise the works, he or she could nonetheless be liable for a failure to notice poor workmanship during a periodic inspection, if a competent architect would have done so. This is actually a good example of a real problem that comes up again and again in professional liability, namely defining what work is reasonably incidental to a retainer. And whilst it might be thought sensible to try to cut down work falling within that category through a scope of work clause, some courts have expressed misgivings about professionals doing exactly that, particularly in areas like family law with arguably vulnerable clients. The second clause uh, on the slide is amount of damages clauses. These are relatively self-explanatory. They can range from a complete exclusion of all liability to a limitation to a particular sum. The latter is far more common than the former, perhaps because there generally remains to an extent a view that it is simply inappropriate for professional people to seek to exclude all liability for their services. In addition, of course, to the various statutory provisions which don't look kindly upon such clauses. Third, types of damages. These seek to exclude liability for specific types of losses. In the professional services context, these typically tend to be exclusions for matters such as consequential losses, loss of profits, or anticipated profits. Consequential losses mean any loss which is not directly caused by the breach, arising from a claimant's particular circumstances, which the parties knew or should have known about when the contract was entered into. The trouble with this type of clause in the professional liability context is, of course, that pro professionals are particularly prone to causing exactly this type of loss, begging the question of whether excluding this type of damage could ever be said to be reasonable. Fourth, time period to bring a claim. These clauses are slightly different in that they effectively seek to impose procedural as opposed to substantive limits to bringing claims. And as Helen will explain later, such clauses have generally not found favour with the regulators. A further variation on that theme is a clause which makes the bringing of a claim subject to further hurdles, such as participating in ADR before proceedings can be brought. Finally, proportionate liability and net contribution clauses, these essentially seek to limit or apportion uh, responsibility based on matters such as relative fault. Moving on then to clauses seeking to restrict liability to third parties. These present slightly different issues. A classic example is the Bannerman uh, clause added to audit reports, which generally states that the report is made solely to the company's members as a body, pursuant to the statutory requirements, and that no responsibility is assumed to anyone other than the company and its members for the audit work, the report, or the opinions expressed therein. These are very commonly encountered, and for the simple reason that audited accounts are probably some of the most broadly published work undertaken by any professionals, who of course lose all control over the documents as soon as they get put up onto company's house. So as a matter of principle, where a third party has not paid for any services and isn't in a contractual arrangement with the relevant professional, it may be thought perfectly acceptable for a professional person to seek to exclude liability to such third parties. However, long-standing authorities such as Smith and Eric Bush and more recent iterations of the same principle show that the position is not always quite so straightforward. And I will come back to those authorities later on this afternoon. For now, I will hand you back to Helen who will address some of the potential roadblocks that limitation clauses might encounter. So here's my section on the problems. Lawyers always love talking about the problems, don't they? There are a range of roadblocks that can potentially be in the path of exclusion or limitation clauses in professional liability cases, which I see as falling into four main categories. The first category is general prohibitions on certain types of clause relating to certain types of activities or claims. 
and those prohibitions tend to derive from public policy, as I will explain. The second is rules relating to particular types of client, where you have a distinction between consumer clients, where the position is governed by the Consumer Rights Act, and uh, non-consumer clients, where you're thinking about UCTA. Then you have statutory provisions relating to certain types of professional activity, and that tends to be a real patchwork of different provisions. For instance, the parts of the Companies Act dealing with statutory auditors and their ability to limit their liability. And last but not least, you have the regulatory rules which apply to different professions. And those can also leach into civil claims because often the courts in civil claims will be looking at the regulator's attitude to see whether certain clauses can be counted as reasonable or not. So I'll start then by telling you about the general public policy issues. The first general prohibition that you need to be aware of is that a person cannot exclude liability for his own fraud or deliberate wrongdoing. This principle will be familiar to anyone in this room who also deals with insurance coverage, where you tend to get the opposite problem, namely that people can't insure for that either. But as in the insurance context, the basic rule can be boldly stated, but it starts fraying around the edges when you look at it more closely, and in particular, it starts fraying when you're talking about the position of employees and agents who are implicated in fraud or in wrongful behaviour. You may have seen the recent case of Innovate Pharmaceuticals and University of Portsmouth, uh, which featured our own Claire Dixon, KC, and Will Birch. That's a good case in point to illustrate what I'm talking about. The Innovate case involved a company which wanted to test the potential of a drug to treat uh, brain tumours. It therefore entered into a research agreement with the University of Portsmouth, where the university was going to carry out a pilot study. The research agreement included a clause which said that the university was not liable to innovate for certain types of loss, such as loss of profit, for any representation unless fraudulent. That's only part of the clause, but it's the bit we're focusing on here. A second clause said that the liability of each party to the other arising out of any breach, error or omission, and again, except in the case of fraudulent representation, would be limited to a million pounds. The university carried out the research, but from the perspective of Innovate, the findings were disappointing. Innovate alleged that the research paper included errors, which were the product of dishonesty and sought damages for having to repeat the work and also for a loss of value of its patent. The university denied wrongdoing, but in the alternative, it sought to rely on its limitation of liability terms. So that, of course, brought up the question of whether those terms could properly uh, exclude uh, allegations of wrongdoing against the university's employees or agents. The university accepted that it couldn't rely on the limitation term if the research agreement itself had been induced by fraud, but said that it could do so if its employees or agents had been dishonest, although they denied that they had been dishonest. The uh, university argued that limitation of liability clauses should not be treated with the same suspicion as wholesale exclusion clauses. The judge held that the limitation clause would have been effective to limit liability for dishonest breaches of contract if such breaches had in fact occurred. On the particular relationship in issue, we were talking about a commercial research agreement. The judge found that an exclusion encompassing dishonesty of agents was not unreasonable in that context. There had been equal bargaining power when the um, agreement was entered into and there had been active negotiations. The remuneration that the university earned for the project was limited and so it wasn't surprising that in turn it wished to limit its liability. Here's where a bit of a word of caution comes in. This is one of those areas where it's quite dangerous to suppose that you can lift an outcome from one context and transpose it to another. The judge in the Portsmouth case was willing to give the defendant quite a bit of latitude. As we'll go on to see, a different approach might be called for in relation to professional advisors, particularly ones whose regulators take a consumer-friendly approach when setting professional standards. And as I'll go on to explain, those professional standards are something that the courts will look at when deciding the question of reasonableness. There's a further brief lesson to be drawn from the Deckett litigation that I started with, 
As I mentioned at the beginning, Deckett's terms included a clause capping their liability at £3 million, but stating that the limitation would not operate to exclude or limit any liability for fraud or reckless disregard of professional obligations or liabilities which cannot lawfully be limited or excluded. The claimants said that they could get round that cap by saying that there was at least reckless wrongdoing on the part of the defendants. And they said that the clause should operate disjunctively, so as soon as you had fraud or reckless uh, disregard of professional regulations or um, liabilities which could not lawfully be excluded, um, you fell outside. Deckett disagreed and tried to argue that those uh, features of the clause were conjunctive rather than disjunctive. The judge didn't agree with Deckert and held that the wording should be read disjunctively, but one senses an unease in the judgment with the idea of solicitors being able to cap their liability for reckless disregard of their duties. So I will turn now to my second topic, which is type of claimant. As I mentioned a moment ago, the distinction is to, between two principal types of claimant. On the one hand, you have consumers, and on the other hand, you have everybody else. If a client is an individual who is acting wholly or largely outside his trade or profession, then he, will be, he or she will be in the territory of the Consumer Rights Act and arguably have stronger position when um, challenging an exclusion or limitation clause. People meeting the definition of consumers tend to congregate in some areas of professional liability and not others. So, for instance, solicitors dealing with family law, wills and conveyancing, or so on, will commonly be dealing with consumers. Financial advisors will commonly be dealing with consumers. Accountants will sometimes be dealing with them, and I can't see how statutory auditors would ever be dealing with them. As I will come on to explain, um, my theory is that some of this may have coloured the attitude of various professional regulators when dealing with this type of clause. Under the Consumer Rights Act, as I put up on the slide, the core test is whether a term is unfair, uh, and which is judged by reference to whether it's contrary to the requirement of good faith and causes a significant imbalance in the party's rights and obligations under the contract to the detriment of the consumer. The test's a bit different to UCTA, as we'll come on to in a moment, and in practice, it tends to be uh, approached from a rather more consumer-centric starting point. The Consumer Rights Act also has a grey list of terms at Schedule 8 which are likely to be unfair. They're couched in the language of traders, but they do apply to professionals as well. And one of them, uh, for instance, would uh, deal with the ability to terminate a retainer after you've started. The position as regards all non-consumer clients is governed by UCTA, which probably most of us are more familiar with. But this piece of legislation is sometimes thought of as only applying to exclusions or caps and liability. In fact, its reach goes much further than that. Section 13 makes clear that it applies to a number of the types of clause that Marie Claire was explaining at the beginning of her talk. For instance, it applies to clauses which make the enforcement of a contract subject to restrictive or onerous conditions. That would be a, a limited period to bring a claim, for instance. Uh, it applies to clauses that restrict rights and remedies, and it applies to clauses which exclude or restrict rules of evidence or procedure. So that can come up in a situation where somebody is taken to have accepted a certification or something of that nature. Furthermore, both excluding liability and declining to accept it in the first place have been held in some circumstances to be tantamount to clauses falling within UCTA. And the key case on that is Harris and Wire Forest. It's not always easy to tell what a court's going to see as a basis clause, which is just uncontroversially setting out the scope of the work to be done, and what a uh, court will see as a clause that's coming within the territory of UCTA because it's excluding certain work. Sometimes it can be clear, as Marie Claire mentioned earlier, with her example that architects don't supervise builders. But it gets trickier the closer the work gets to a person's usual duties. And don't even get me started on all the case law about what's reasonably incidental to somebody's usual duties, which is a particular problem area for this. This is a topic that Marie Claire is going to come back to when she discusses whether the generous approach that the Court of Appeal took some years ago to solicitors' retainers and the ability to circumscribe them in the case of Minkin and Landsberg may be on the wane. <laughs> 
Turning back though to UCTA, so far as excluding liability for negligence is concerned, Section 2 provides that this can only be done in so far as it meets the requirements of reasonableness. The test under Section 11 is whether the clause is a fair and reasonable one to be included, having regard to the circumstances which were or ought reasonably to have been made known or in the contemplation of the parties when the contract was made. You'll see that Section 11 is a bit different to the Consumer Rights Act. It doesn't overtly focus so much on imbalance or good faith. However, there is a list of considerations in Schedule 2 to UCTA in which imbalance between the parties is one of the relevant factors that the court is invited to think about. Where the client's a business and could be expected to look after itself, the courts have tended to take a more favourable approach to upholding limitation clauses than when you are dealing uh, with uh, people who fall outside the Consumer Rights Act but aren't sophisticated businesses. Section 11.4 of UCTA also contains a further express test of reasonableness, which is probably the one that we spend most time looking at in the professional liability context. And that's the requirement to have regard to first the resources that a defendant can be expected to have available to meet the liability, and secondly, how far it is open to a defendant to protect him or herself by insurance. As I'll come on to explain, it seems to me that that latter point seems to have had particular impact in terms of the thinking of the SRA in this area when we come to look at the regulatory rules. It's worth noting that as soon as a point is raised about the reasonableness of a clause that a defendant is trying to rely on, it falls to the defendant to prove that the terms are reasonable. This can sometimes be overlooked if your starting point is always that the claimant has to prove everything, but the defendant has to do the running in terms of explaining the thinking behind the clause and putting together the evidence to put forward that argument. Of course, sometimes there's little that can be said. Hertenstein and Hill Dickinson uh, was a case in 2014 where, for whatever reason, the defendant didn't run a positive case to defend its clause, which the judge pointed out, and the judge found that the clause wasn't reasonable. Of course, a further problem in that case is that the work on Mr. Hertenstein's case had started before Hill Dickinson had sent the terms over to him. But the case is also useful to know about because it's the key case which makes clear that the courts will have a look at what the professional regulators think about a clause or type of clause when approaching the question of reasonableness. So that shows how the regulatory angle can feed back into the civil side. I'm now going to pick a couple of examples of the statutory patchwork quilt that applies to various professions. We'd be here all afternoon and beyond if I tried to tell you every single statute that applies, so I've just picked ones that apply to auditors and solicitors. Although auditors are some of the most enthusiastic excluders of liability to third parties, for reasons that Marie Claire has already explained, their ability to exclude or limit liability to their own clients in statutory audits is heavily constrained by the provisions that I put up on the slide. Section 532 of the Companies Act stops statutory auditors from excluding liability altogether. However, they are permitted to limit their liability in some circumstances, which again circumscribed as set out by the Act, namely the limitation has to be authorised by the members of the company and entered into on an annual basis. I suspect all of us have seen cases where somebody's terms and conditions have been sent out and languished over the course of many years and are uh, said to be applying to all sorts of work that were never contemplated at the outset. That's not going to work in an audit case. The agreement is also only effective to the extent that is regarded by uh, the court as reasonable. So this is an interesting point of contrast with UCTA. Under the Companies Act, the court can substitute a reasonable cap rather than just striking it down exact entirely. The next bit of the patchwork quilt is the position with solicitors. And so far as solicitors are concerned, the main prohibition is in section 60 of the Solicitors Act 1974, which um, bites if you have got a contentious business agreement and you have got a client who is acting for purposes outside his trade, business or profession. So again, you've got a consumer type client. Section 60 clearly prevents the exclusion of liability. The author of the defences chapter in Jackson and Powell suggests it logically extends to limiting 
liability in this sphere as well. Otherwise, the clause could be rendered nugatory by, say, a one pence limit. However, to my knowledge, there's no authority actually dealing with this point. So my final topic on um, roadblocks is the approach of regulators. The starting point for this section is that, from my perception at least, different regulators seem to take different approaches to limitations and exclusions. Some are much more overt and proactive than others, the SRA and the FCA having lengthier and more express rules than, say, some of the accountancy regulators. I think the FCA rules that I put up on the slide are quite a good place to start because they show you two of the core concerns of regulators in this area. The first is an absolute prohibition on people trying to contract out of the regulatory provisions that apply to them. So in COBS paragraph 2.12, you have that absolute prohibition. Um, I have yet to see a limitation clause that's ever tried to do that, but it is an issue that sometimes comes up when you're trying to settle a case if a professional person is anxious that somebody's going to report them. So that has to be remembered in that context too. The second express rule is that a firm may not seek to exclude other liability unless it's honest, fair and professional for it to do so. As I put on the second half of the slide, the SRA also takes a consumer-friendly approach, although its rules are a bit more scattered around and consequently are a bit more difficult to find. The main ones I think you need to be aware of are Regulation 3.2 of the SRA Indemnity <coughs> Insurance Rules, which stops total exclusions of liability on the part of solicitors, but allows a limitation of liability to a sum no less than the compulsory insurance carried by insurers. But you also have to think about Principle 7, which I put up on the slide, which requires solicitors to act in the best interests of clients. That rule, or at least its predecessor in the 2011 Code of Conduct, did rear its head in the case of SRA and Jones and Hillier McCown. And that's quite a good illustration of how regulators can take a clause about clients' best interests and um, apply it to the limitation uh, of liability context. In the case of Jones and Hillier McCown, the solicitors had advised on SDT avoidance schemes, which uh, evolved, involved a rather um, exotic and con contrived array of transactions of the type that I think probably many of us in this room have seen. The solicitors who gave that advice tried to limit the period in which a claim could be brought against them to three years rather than the usual period under the Limitation Act. They were charged with breaching what was then principles four, five, and six of the SRA principles. The first one was the equivalent of principle seven. Um, the second one was uh, failing to provide a proper standard of service to your clients. And finally, and perhaps most startlingly, um, behaving in a way that maintains the trust that the public places in you and the provision of legal services. Um, the matter was dealt with by way of uh, admissions uh, the SDT accepted that those rules had been breached and fined both the individual solicitor and the firm. And as I noted before, when I was talking to you about the Hertenstein case, the attitude of the SRA and therefore judgments in the SDT are going to be relevant and helpful to a claimant if they're trying to beat down that type of clause in civil proceedings. Finally, I turn with a bit of trepidation to the ICAW because I'm aware that there are several ICAW people in the room um, as I've pointed out, their members are often in a bit of a different position to IFAs or solicitors because of the very public nature of some of the documents that their members produce, audited accounts being the most stark example of that. So it seems to me that a regulator like the ICAW has to be much more alive to the risk of a flood of claims from third parties in reliance on accounts, for instance, whilst also making sure it's properly policing the provisions of Section 532 onwards of the Companies Act and seeking to uphold standards in the profession. Against this backdrop, the public uh, guidance of the ICAW tends to be um, less prescriptive than some of the other regulators in terms of uh, prohibiting limitations of liability. And rather than imposing its own gloss, the guidance largely restates the relevant bits of the Companies Act and UCTA. Marie Claire, in her overview, has mentioned the issue of bannerman clauses as between auditors and third parties, and those types of clauses are supported by the ICAW's guidance. But as I said when I was talking about the University of Portsmouth case, you have to take a bit of care 
about transposing principles you find in relation to one profession or area into another. And it seems to me, from what I've been explaining, that there are some important cultural differences between some of the regulators and the type of work that they're regulating. Finally, before handing back to Mary Claire, I want to add a few observations about misgivings in some cases about unfair advantage. There's an undertone in some of the reported civil decisions rejecting attempts to rely on limitation clauses that the defendant would be somehow sneaking an advantage if they managed to rely on it. When I was talking to you about the ENRC and Deckett case, I explained that one of the arguments was over whether the limitation clause could um, stand in the way of an attempt to recover fees that had been paid to the firm, which were in excess of what ought to have been paid. The CAP didn't expressly refer to that type of claim and instead referred to our liability to you for all losses arising for or connection in our services. In that case, the judge, uh, Waxman, expressed concerns that if the clause extended to, to uh, impose a cap on repayment of fees, it would interfere with a right that claimants have uh, for an assessment of fees as between them and their lawyers under the Solicitors Act. So it seems to me that if you've got a limitation clause which arguably uh, trumps somebody's right that's been given to them by statute, that's going to be quite a tricky ask in terms of defending it. It's not the only case expressing some queasiness about conduct matters. And a, a good example to lead up to Marie Claire's section of the talk is Hurlingham Estate and Wild. And that was a case where a solicitor had taken on a piece of work and in the course of a conference tried to limit the scope of his duties to drafting and exclude tax matters, but didn't clearly tell the client about his rights to go and get advice elsewhere. It was all a bit ad hoc. Um, the court uh, weren't very interested in upholding uh, attempts to limit the scope of a retainer in that way. And it could be argued, uh, I'll leave Barry Clare to argue it, that there is some parallel between that attempt to constrain the uh, scope of a retainer and the case of Lewis and Cunnington's, which Mary Claire is going to deal with in the moment. What is odd, though, is that I very rarely see claims where claimants are complaining about scope of retainer issues where they've actually reached for regulatory law or law on the limitation of liability. Uh, this may turn out to be an area that claimants increasingly seek to exploit, though, as thinking about these issues develop. Right, I will hand over now to Mary Claire to tell you about disclaimers, uh, including the case of Lewis and Cunnington's, in which I unfortunately came second. <laughs> so, as Helen has mentioned, uh, a key recent case in respect of own client disclaimers is Lewis and Cunnington's solicitors. In Lewis, the claimant, Mrs. Lewis, alleged that as a result of her solicitor's negligence in the conduct of divorce proceedings, she had entered into an unfair settlement agreement with her former husband. In particular, she argued that she should have obtained a pension sharing order and had suffered loss in the region of a half a million pounds as a result. At the outset, the retainer letter had presented Mrs. Lewis with a range of options as to how her financial dispute might be settled. They were one, direct agreement between the parties themselves, two, mediation, three, collaboration, and four, the traditional court bill. <coughs> By a further letter after the initial retainer letter, the solicitors indicated to Mrs. Lewis that Whilst she could agree a settlement directly with her former husband, i.e. choose option one, if she did so, the solicitors would not be able to advise her on whether or not the terms of the settlement were fair and reasonable. So some months passed by, and Mrs Lewis ultimately informed the solicitors that she had indeed agreed a direct settlement with her former husband, whereby, amongst other matters, he would pay her the sum of £62,000, on a clean break basis. The solicitors uh, responded again, explaining they could not comment on whether or not the agreement was fair or reasonable, particularly in the absence of financial disclosure in the proceedings, which they hadn't seen. They also informed Mrs Lewis that she would need to sign and return an express disclaimer confirming that she understood that she hadn't been given any advice in relation to financial matters. <coughs> And because there had been no financial disclosure, 
the defendant could not advise the fairness or reasonableness of the settlement. The disclaimer was duly signed by Mrs Lewis and thereafter the consent order was also signed, sent to the defendant and sealed. Fast forward a few years later, Mrs Lewis comes across Divorce Lifeline online which offered to investigate potential claims for individuals who felt that their divorce settlements may have been unfair. Uh, somewhat unsurprisingly, this led to Mrs Lewis instructing solicitors and bringing the claim against Cunningtons. The scope of the defendant solicitor's retainer was one of the key issues in dispute in the proceedings. It was Mrs Lewis's case that the settlement she had reached with the husband was so obviously unfair that she should have been advised to apply for a pension sharing order and that the defendant had been negligent in saying that in the absence of full financial disclosure that it couldn't provide her with advice. Uh, the solicitor's primary position was that Mrs Lewis had agreed to the proposed settlement without any involvement by them and in the absence of financial disclosure. This had led them to tell her that they were unable to comment on the reasonableness of the settlement and they also relied, unsurprisingly, on the express disclaimer that Mrs Lewis had signed. The solicitors in particular argued that, as in, in Minkin, once the claimant had reached a deal, their duty was limited solely to implementing the settlement agreement. Minkin, as you may recall, was a case all about solicitors wishing to be able to offer tailored legal services with um, narrower duties than usual in low-value family law cases. And the Court of Appeal in that case was, in fact, very anxious to uphold the solicitor's ability to do so. Yet, in Lewis and Cunnington's, the court upheld the claimant's claim. So why was that? Well, it distinguished Minkin on the basis that, in that case, the solicitor had been instructed from the outset solely and exclusively to draft a consent order on terms which the client had already agreed. However, in the present case, the retainer was a general retainer at the outset. The solicitors already had some knowledge of the client's position, which suggested that a pension sharing order would be appropriate. They also knew that the husband had been making unreasonably low offers to Mrs Lewis. In those circumstances, the court thought that what would be reasonably incidental to the work of drafting the settlement agreement would be more expansive than in the Minkin type scenario. And in particular, there was a duty to warn or report and advise on matters of which the solicitors were aware. Interestingly, the court also took the view that the attempt to limit the defendant's responsibilities with a one size fits all disclaimer was not appropriate. The defendant, they thought, did have enough information to advise, even if in general terms, as to the reasonableness or otherwise of the proposed settlement. This required the solicitors, the court found, to at least set out a comparison between what the claimant would receive through the proposed settlement and what she would reasonably receive if she had pursued the matter to court. So the decision in Lewis is of interest because it shows the court taking a doubtful view about Minkin-style arguments on scope of the retainer, which arise after the start of the matter. However, query why it should matter when the retainer was limited, if the relevant facts giving rise to the claim, i.e. the agreement of the settlement, indisputably occurred after the retainer was limited. As Helen noted earlier, in the case of Hertenstein, the court expressed misgivings about a solicitor seeking to limit his duties where there are areas he could not advise on, in circumstances where the client wasn't told about their option to get advice elsewhere. So in Lewis, it may be that there is an undertone of concern about solicitors reducing the scope of their duties after taking on a case. However, such a limitation ought not to be impossible if the aim of being able to buy bespoke limited legal services, as explained in Minkin, is to be upheld. So in this respect, uh, we doubt Lewis it, it will be the last word on the subject. Uh, the cases involving third parties are an interesting contrast. 
In sum, the courts have shown a more forgiving approach to defendants, even in the absence of any disclaimer. However, in others, they have been inclined to side with the claimant in suggesting that issues relating to duty should go to trial, notwithstanding uh, the defendant's attempt to disclaim liability. And quite where the cases are going is not immediately easy to see. Taking first an example of a case where there was no disclaimer, so McLean and Thornhill, of which many of you I'm sure will be aware, in that case the defendant was a tax silk who advised the promoters of film finance tax schemes which were marketed to potential investors via an investment memorandum. Claims were brought against him by various investors in the schemes who were not his clients. Mr. Thornhill had consented to his opinions being made available to investors if they requested them, but notably, the opinions contained no disclaimers of liability to third parties. As a result, the claimants alleged that Mr. Thornhill owed them a duty of care in respect of the advice that he had given to the promoters. But both at first instance and on appeal, the court disagreed. Even though there was no disclaimer, the court ultimately concluded that it was of significance that the investment memorandum had informed the potential investors to consult their own tax advisors. Furthermore, those investors could only participate in the scheme once they had warranted that they had relied on their own tax advice. So turning to the next case, uh, Amathus Drinks and EIGK, in that case, even an express disclaimer did not give the defendant <coughs> auditor sufficient basis to strike out the claim against it. The first and second claimants were parties to a share purchase agreement. They brought a claim against the defendant auditors, claiming that they had failed to spot a fraud practiced on the company, which meant that they had overpaid the purchase price. The auditors relied on the classic Bannerman style disclaimer, which I mentioned earlier, and it was argued that this was effectively a complete barrier to the claim brought against it. However, in that case, the court noted that there had been evidence of emails between the claimants and the defendant auditor, which suggested a continuing relationship. And this continuing relationship, where it was clear that the buyers were relying on the defendant auditor to produce accurate accounting figures, could, the court thought, indicate an assumption of responsibility. In the circumstances, it followed that there was a realistic, as opposed to fanciful, prospect of the claimants establishing an assumption of responsibility, and therefore the claim was not struck out on that basis. Precisely the opposite decision was reached in the Hong Kong case of Chan Kam Chung and Ronnie Choi, where uh, the shareholders' claim against the former auditors of the company was struck out on the basis simply that no duty of care was owed. The facts were very different. In Ronnie Choi, there was no buyout on the horizon when the defendant auditor accepted its engagement. And additionally, the reliance on direct communications with the defendant auditor didn't assist in establishing a duty as they took place after the submission of the audit reports. In Ronnie Choi, no disclaimer was relied upon or discussed, so one assumes that none existed on the facts. Yet yeah, even that didn't appear to have assisted the claimants in defending the strikeout application. So ultimately, the moral of the story in third-party cases seems to be that a disclaimer is only a factor relevant to establishing a duty of care. <coughs> Mathis shows that there are prospects of establishing a duty notwithstanding the existence of a disclaimer, yet McLean and Ronnie Choi show that a duty can be negated notwithstanding the lack of any relevant third party disclaimer. So even if a defendant manages to prove that the disclaimer is enforceable per se, it may not have the de desired effect ultimately. So far we have focused our session on the position as between claimants and defendants. However, I will pass back over to Helen who will discuss how limitation works as between defendants. Sorry, I just need to get Mike back up. I didn't leave the room because I can't tolerate listening to cases I've lost. Um, my voice is now at the outer reaches of my ability to keep going because I've had a nasty cough, so let's hope it survives the last few minutes. <clears throat> so net contribution clauses. 
These are also known as proportionate liability clauses, and what they set out to do is to limit a professional person's liability to a fair and reasonable or a just and equitable proportion of a claimant's overall loss. You may be wondering, what's the point, given that we've got the Civil Liability Contribution Act, which does the same thing? Well, the point is that they aim to reverse the starting point of joint and several liability, and they put the risk of one defendant going bust, being underinsured, or having a stringent liability clause that they've managed to defend on the claimant rather than on the co-defendants. After all, the claimant is the person who can try and control the terms on which he or she contracts with his professional or her professional advisors in the first place. It's quite rare that professionals get any say in the terms on which their co-professionals are advising, and you often get multidisciplinary pieces of work, for instance, share purchase agreements or construction products, where people can find themselves at the mercy of other people's um, limitation clauses. In my experience, accountants and construction professionals are quite good at protecting themselves with clauses like this, but they don't seem to have caught on quite so much in other areas. So far, there hasn't been a great deal of reported law about them either. The one case that there is, West and Finley, that I put up on the slide, gave the clause a relatively easy ride. In that case, the clause was drafted in a very similar way to UCTA, and that may mean that a judge's gut instinct is to be that the clause is, is likely to be fair, because it just mirrors statutory language. But the corollary of these clauses benefiting defendants is, of course, that in some cases they will disadvantage claimants, because claimants can't recover all of their loss from uh, a range of professionals, and in fact, are the people who are going to suffer if one particular defendant goes bust or is underinsured. And um, I don't think there's been a great deal of argument yet, there was some argument in West, but not a great deal of argument yet about uh, claimants being inappropriately disadvantaged by this type of clause. Another clause I've yet to see any argument about in a reported case is a clause whereby a claimant agrees to put a professional advisor back in the position that it would have been in uh, under the Contribution Act if the claimant hadn't gone and agreed a cap with another professional advisor that has disadvantaged the first set of professionals. Of course, in that type of situation, the professional advisor uh, who's trying to run that type of argument is likely also to be taking pot shots at the co-defendant's clause, which comes back to one of the points that I started with, namely that this isn't just a problem for claimant lawyers, but it's something that defendant lawyers really have to be on top of, because often uh, there's always that are we friends or are we foes type situation that you have with your co-defendants, uh, and taking uh, arguments about their clauses is definitely an area where you're likely to be foes. So um, I've managed to survive without my voice completely deserting me. Um, Mary Claire is going to try and draw a few threads together at the end in the conclusion section. So as Helen said, I will wrap up with a few final headline conclusions to take away. First, in the world of limitation clauses, deeds, not words, matter. An exclusion of liability is unlikely to be effective if the defendant nonetheless strays into the area which it has sought to exclude, or goes ahead and provides advice to third parties with which it claims not to be involved. Second, remember the regulators. As Helen has outlined, they are often the source of helpful additional guidance and authority beyond that contained in statute and case law. And finally, limitations have their own limits. In particular, no exclusions for fraud or deliberate wrongdoing. Entire exemption clauses are likely to be off limits. Procedural bars are likely to run into additional problems. And finally, caps on quantum or excluding certain types of damage can work, but the more swinging the cut, the less likely the defendant is to win on it. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.